Welcome. In this video, we're going to look at how to institute a chasing behavior with the enemies. We want the enemies to be able to chase after the player because currently, as the player moves around and does have walled collisions, that the enemies are parked. So that's going to be one of our first orders of business is we want them to chase the player. So to do that, we need to go into the enemy class and update what we have happening in our update method. So just going to, so this is updating for the visual stuff or actually animation would be better for the animation stuff. Now we need to update the chase behavior. And there's lots of things that we can do. And what we're going to do with this is institute a simple distance comparison so that the enemy is going to calculate that when the player's within a certain radius or distance away, that it starts trying to chase. And then it's going to decide to use either the horizontal or vertical movement component based on whichever distance is greater. We're not going to put pathfinding in so that the enemy, while it's trying to chase, if it runs into a wall, is going to then be able to investigate what other movement options it has so that it can still continue to try to hunt down the player because that's a more complex pathfinding algorithm. We're just going to use a really simple basic chasing behavior. So to do that, what we want to do is we want to calculate our distance apart. And we can do that by using the distance method that we've used prior and we're going to use the player's x and we're calculating based on the center. So remember that now that we're using sprite-based artwork x and y corresponds to the top left corner of that rectangle of the sprite, but we want to know the distance between their centers. So then we're going to add in the player's, half of the player's width on it. And then we, so we have two points. We're the point of the player, then the point of the enemy. So we're just putting the player in first. And then our next two points are going to be our sprite here, which it looks about the same, except we can just use X and Y and width and height. We don't have to designate that it belongs to, in this case, the player. And then Y plus H divided by two. So similar kinds of math that we've calculated before, but we're figuring out how far apart the two are. Now, what we're going to do is just very temporarily I'm just going to write this on screen and I will say, I oh, need some quotes there. And then we'll, we'll use our variable, then we'll just put that at 50, 50. Now, if we run this, Currently, what we see happening is these numbers. Now we have two numbers that are happening here because both enemies are doing that. So let's just change our number of enemies to one. We'll just go with one. Because once we know this works, then we can do it. So now we can see our distance is we can see how that changes. And knowing that our sprites are 32 by 32, so when that number is less than 30, we would have to be intersecting. So what I'm trying to do here is just prove, well, I can't get to that side, but we can do three of the four sides here. So we've proven that distance, we can see how the number changes here and gives us value that we need. All right, so that's just a starting part. 
it's sometimes useful just to write values like that onto your visual while you're working. We'll get rid of that when we're all done here, but we're doing it right now just so we can understand a little bit more of how things are working. So what I want is I want to have when my distance apart is less than 200, at that point, that's when I want to start chasing. And I see right here, I'm just gonna put in, cause we're gonna end up with more stuff in here. So let's put these, finish putting um, closing statements in or closing comments. And I seem to have some fat typing fingers today. We're getting some issues. Let's just space that out a little bit so we can see that's happening. So there's animation stuff, here's our chase stuff. And on something like this that's a major header, it sometimes it's nice to put in just a little bit more so we can see visually what is happening. All right, so if the distance apart is less than 200, then I want to chase. So then if that is true, if the distance apart is less than 200, then I want to close largest gap. So that means we're going to say if the absolute value, so we take the player's x and we subtract the enemy's x. So if that is going to be less than the absolute value of the player's y minus the enemy's y, so if that's true, then this means, so if the x is less than the y, then what we want to do is go text. And again, I'm just writing things on screen just to make it easier to see what's happening. So we'll close the vertical gap and we'll just put that at 250. So it's just next to those values. So. So remember that with this if, anything inside there, this whole distance part if, will only take place when we're within 200 pixels. If not, we, we don't want to do anything. We just want to not be chasing. So to do that, we are closing the largest gap first. So that means close the, the vertical gap else. I mean, our other situation would be we're closing the horizontal gap. So now I can go text closing horizontal gap right there. Again, put in these closing comments because as we end up with lots of nested curly braces, it's really useful to see that. So distance apart, now let me, and now, okay, and I did not spell horizontal right. Horn. There we go. That looks better. So now let's run that again. All right. So now if I move up, and we can see that the distance apart is now 177, 189. So closing that horizontal gap, and now we can see the vertical gap is more than the horizontal, so it's closing, it would be closing the vertical gap. So our logic is working, but now we have to figure out how to make it move left or right, up or down. And we only want it to be moving in one of those directions at a time, unless we end up with like at 45 degrees from it, then it will keep closing one, then the other one, then the other, and it, it it's an unfortunate part of how this algorithm is going to work, but for the time being, I think we're gonna live with it in the interest of keeping things from getting overly complex on it. So what we need to do is we need to figure out when we're closing the vertical gap, that means we're going to be moving either up or down. 
So when we're closing the vertical gap, we need to find out is the player above or is the enemy above? So if the enemy is above, that means it needs to go down. If the enemy is below it, it needs to go up. So we use another conditional and say if y is less than the player's y, So if y is less than, so that means that's our current situation here. y is less than the player's y. So that means well, we need to move down. So what I'm going to do is go move up is going to be equal to false. And move down is going to be equal to true. And Fix that. Now, so I'll move up and move down. Now, an interesting thing about this is we don't have a move up. Because if I go here, move up does not exist. Go here, move down. There's an error because the first one, because neither one exists. So what we want to do is we want to first figure out the directions we can move. Then we're going to put in the movement logic where we will then update much like we have on the player, which is where the player has left, right, up, and down. We have for the enemy, we're just going to call it move up and move down, but it's going to be built into the class here. So we say boolean. Move left, move up, move right, move down. So just going around our circle, the left, up, right, down. And now let's give those all starting values. Oh. Now they shall start at false. And then move up equal to false. Move right is equal to false. And move down equal to false. So what we're doing is we're storing the movements the same way that we have. The player has left, right, up, and down when we press the keys here. We now have things tied into it based on our values that we have there. And in my erasing miss typos, I forgot an equal so move up is false, move down is true because we want it to move down. So I forgot the equal sign when I typed it in. I was like, why is it red? I don't know. Oh, duh. That's silly. So now if we're not, if we're trying to close the y gap, and if we're not moving down, that means we must be moving up. So let's put that in and say move up. Now, I'm going to, when I have move up, move down, or move left, move right with the pairs, I'm going to keep it in the same order each time versus switching which one's on top. I think it's just a little bit easier to keep track of. And we'll just clean up the formatting on here. So now we can move set, move up, and move down. And we will be using that pretty much the same logic that we have for the player. But we'll do that now on the enemy. So this closes our Y gap on it. And now we can close our horizontal gap as well. And we will be using the same kind of thing where we have to find out is the enemy left or right of the player. So we go if x is less than the player's x. else there. 
So if x is less than the player's x, so we'll go move left. So if the, the enemy is to the left of the enemy, or the player, it needs to move to the right. So move left will be false. And move right will be true. Now if we go down here, we have move left will be true. And move right will be false. So we've now come up with our ways of setting up that logic the same way as when we would press keys and things would happen with that. So that gives us a starting point. Um, and what we need to do is now figure out how to move into updating the moves here. So this is update our position. And because this is a major one, I'll just put a few more items in there just to make it look a little bit cleaner. So if, let's just keep my spacing so it looks pretty. So move left. So if move left is true and move right is false, then we need to do something here. And what we're going to do inside of that is we'll have our VX. So moving left is true, so it's going to be a negative value. Now, one thing I want to do here is I want to just use a value, a variable for speed. So if I want to change the speed, I don't have to go into each one of my little things and change, you know, VX equals negative one or two, then VX equals positive one or two. I want to just be able to have a single value that I'm working with. So I'm just going to add another variable and we'll call it speed. And we'll make it slower than the player because currently the player's speed is two. So I'm going to make the enemy speed one. So going back into the enemy here. So VX, oh, do we not have VX? We don't have VX, oh, I forgot. You know, we don't have a VX or VY yet. Uh, I was thinking we had already put it in like we did on the player. So we might as well add those in as well. VX, VY. And we'll just give those starting values. VX is equal to zero, VY is equal to zero. All right, so when you build things incrementally, sometimes you forget to put some of those pieces in that you need. So if we're moving horizontally, then we're not going to be moving vertically. That keeps it a little bit cleaner where we are going. And we need to identify which row that we are working with on it. So the player rows are different than the unicorn rows. And we did look at changing out our row numbers last time when we look at doing sprite animation. So pulling up the character sheet, we can see when at the ghost down is going to be our row. So we have down, left, right, up. So we can see as we played with the row here and then we are offsetting things. So we have to choose which row we are working with. So we have our offset that determines which character we're working with and then the row. So to go left, that would be then row one. So we can specify that into it. Now, if move right and not 
move left. This time our Vx is going to be equal to zero and our V, no sorry, Vx is not going to be equal to zero, Vx is going to be equal to speed. Vy is still going to be equal to zero, I was thinking ahead to where I wanted to go and now going right, so we have row zero, row one, row two. So row will be equal to two on it. Now, let's move into our vertical movement. So if move up and not move down, then we have this point Vy. Notice we're doing the Y first because we're talking about Y. So for moving up we need to use a negative number because that means we're trying to get closer to zero which is the top of our game screen. So we'll move at a negative speed. Vx will be equal to zero. And looking at our sheet then that would be rho will be equal to three. And continuing on down we have if move down and not move up. This time our Vy will be equal to our speed because we're trying to move to the bottom of the screen so that's a bigger number. And our Vx will be equal to zero of course and our row will be equal to zero because it's the first row in the bunch. So that now starts to set those things up on it. And let's now add in x is equal to, not equal to, plus equal vx, and y will be plus equals vy. So we're setting, based on move up and move down, move left and move right, we're setting our vx and our vy, so now we can update that. So that now sets us up into having something going on. Now let's try and get closer. I get close enough and now you can see it's chasing after me. Kind of hard when it can walk through walls. Oh, hmm. Well, that's a problem. It just kept going. All right, so one of the things that we're going to run into on this is we need to, when things aren't, when it's not moving up or down anymore, we need to kill that directional velocity on it. So if we're not going to be moving left or right, we need to kill that directional velocity. So I'll just put it up here and say if not move left and not move right. So when they're both false, when our bx equal to zero. And let's repeat that process here for the vertical. So if not move up and not move down, then we have our Vy equal to zero. So that's now killing it. Let's try and run it again. What I'd also like is when it's not chasing, for it to be parked. So we'll take care of that in a moment too. So now it's chasing me. Now I'll go here, okay. And it's trying. And it's not the smartest uh, entity. Now we'll notice that after, because the ups come up and down come after left and right, those are taking precedent here. So that is something that, I mean, again, this is not a perfect moving algorithm, but it is something. So what we want to do is when none of our values are true, we don't want it to just keep wandering off the screen because otherwise we have nothing to kill what is happening. So if we go, if not move left and not move up, and not move right, 
and not move. No, I want a space there so it just looks pretty. Move down. So we have our four cardinal directions. If all four of those are not true, then what we want to do is go Vx is equal to zero, Vy is equal to zero, and current frame will be equal to one. So we just park it on whatever animation it was on so it no longer is updating. And you can see how now it stopped. Let me get closer and it chases. So we have a little bit more of housekeeping we need to do because on our gap closing, if we're not chasing, then we need to set all of our values to false. So I'm just going to put in two more comments here. So this would be and y's. This will be my and x. And now what I want to do is go else like that. Oh, that's not where I wanted. Sorry, wrong place for that. I won't, don't want this one here, so ignore all of that. So even when you put in your closing comments, when you think you know what you're trying to do, I want it to be under my distance apart here. Because either we're chasing, because remember this whole, all of this right here is the chasing. So we're either chasing else we're not. So and if we're not chasing, we need to kill all of our moves. And we kill our moves by going move left is equal to false. Actually, I retype it when I have it perfectly done right up here. Copy that. Now let's just go right here, paste, format, cleans it up. So now we're either chasing, let me try to move away, get far enough away, and now we stopped. Oh, got too close. Now it's hard because you know, he, once we see, once I close that distance, now it starts chasing, chasing. Again, the, these aren't very bright, but it is a basic algorithm on it. So we've managed to get it so that it can kind of chase us throughout the game board but it's not perfect yet. Now we can modify this so that if we don't lock out the other directionals it ends up not prioritizing any of it. You know, let's run it again and what we'll see is it can now move in a diagonal fashion. Which is problematic for the player right now because I can't go through walls while it can. So that's, that's hard. As if it can get through walls, that causes some challenges for me. So what I want to look at next is how to implement our wall collision method for the enemy. With the enemy chasing us, now what we want to do is set it up so that it can't pass through walls. Now it is possible we could make enemies that could potentially, you know, some enemies could go through walls and some could not. We could set that up as an option. So when we instantiate an enemy, we could choose like a ghost maybe can go through walls, but then the other ones can't. So you could set that up. So what we need to do is we need to create the way for it to go through the walls. And the way to do that is we just need to repeat this function of our check wall collision. Because currently this one only works with the player. So I'm just going to copy that. 
and now I can paste this next one and we'll see it's red because it's telling us that it's a duplicated method. Well, it's only duplicated because we're passing in a different parameter. This time if we pass in an enemy object instead of a player object, it's no longer duplicative so it doesn't care. So then that's okay. It would be nice if we, I mean there are some ways that we could handle this. We only need the function once and we'd pass in say a sprite entity. The sprite would be the parent class so player and enemy would be extensions of that. So we're using this concept of inheritance. It adds to our layers of programming right now just having the duplicate function even though it's pretty much just doing the same thing. So I'm just going to paste it in like that. And then we need to apply that inside our method here. So inside draw, after the enemy updates, then we're going to say check wall collisions. And instead of like up here where we pass in the player, this time we'll pass in the enemy we're working with. So we say enemies, en, en, enemies, there we go. Like that. And when we do that, it passes in the enemy. So now let's run this and see what happens. And we can see now the ghost is stuck. But if I move here, now that ghost is, oh, okay, it's coming after me now. That's good. You can see the ghost is going down. It's going left, chasing after us. So yeah, we've now successfully made it chase us. So really the next phase that we want to add to our program is to work on some type of combat state. So we will transform our project from just a simple setup and draw. We will add in states because then we want to add in a combat state. So we leave our current map and then we go and engage in combat with our enemies. We also, now that we know that it's working, we probably don't need to write the text on the screen or distance apart, so we don't need to put that, so we'll comment that out. And then our closing gaps, we can comment those out as well. Let's just run it, make sure it looks a little bit cleaner. There we go. Well, wow, that's dangerous when we start right on top of each other. Okay, so the next phase will be combat.